David's final words or close to his final words to his son Solomon. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 13 and 14, some similar words from the Apostle Paul. But first, being that it is Father's Day and kind of focus on men today, uh, I wanted to help the ladies out. Uh, so I looked up a men's thesaurus. Y'all know what a thesaurus is, right? It's a kind of dinosaur, right? No, it's not. A thesaurus kind of gives you another word that means the same thing as the word you're looking up. Uh, so this is a men's thesaurus, and it's written by a lady by the name of Judy, by the way. But here are some things to help you understand your loving man, okay? Whether that be your husband or your sons or your fathers. The first is the phrase, it's a guy thing you wouldn't understand. What that really means is there is no rational thought pattern connected to what I'm doing, and you have no chance of making it logical, so just leave it alone, okay? The question that you rarely hear, but it's the question, can I help with dinner? What it really means is, why isn't dinner ready? <laughs> and here's a couple of three run together, you know, uh-huh. Sure, honey. Yes, dear. Any of those or any combination of those simply means absolutely nothing. It's a conditioned response to make you think we're listening to you. Okay? How about this? And it would take too long to explain it to you, dear. That actually means I really have no idea how this works, and I'm not about to read the directions. Just let me do it. All right? Uh, how about this one? Take a break, honey. You're working too hard. You need a rest. Probably don't hear that too often either. What it really means is I can't hear the TV over the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> your husband or your sons ever say, that's interesting. <laughs> what it really means is are you still talking? You ever have your husband say to you, you know how bad my memory is, what it really means is, you know, I can remember the theme song to Gilligan's Island, I know the address of the first girl I ever kissed, and I know the VIN, vehicle identification number, for the first car I drove. I don't know how I forgot it was your birthday. <laughs> don't fuss, I just cut myself, it's no big deal. What that actually means is I have severed a limb <laughs> and I will bleed to death before I ever let you know that I've hurt myself that badly. Okay. Any of you had your sons or your husbands say, I can't find it? Let me tell you what that really means. It means it didn't fall into my outstretched hand, so I'm completely clueless as to where it is. How about when your man says, I heard you? What it really means is I have the foggiest clue what you just said, and I'm hoping desperately that I can fake it well enough so that you don't spend the next three days yelling at me. <laughs> and Ed Marcarella's got his head in his hands, so <laughs> apparently there's something going on over there. <laughs> How about this one? I'm, I'm not lost. I know exactly where we are. Yeah, what that really means is no one is ever going to see us alive again. <laughs> you ever had one say, what did I do this time? You know what it really means? What'd you catch me doing? <laughs> and then one final one, this I'll get some flack on uh, back on this. Okay, I'll try. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, if you want to fuss at me after church about this, don't bother because, you know, it's, it's just a little, little fun. You ever had one say, I'm going fishing? <laughs> you know what that really means? 
I'm going to drink myself dangerously stupid and stand by a stream with a stick in my hand while the fish swim by in absolute safety. Okay, <laughs> there you go. Translation. Men's tra yeah, well, I didn't tell them all. Believe me, I've got a couple more for you. Let me tell you about a kid named Austin. He was my oldest son's earliest, one of his earliest childhood friends. They were in elementary school together. And I was really proud of, of Cameron for this because Austin was of small stature. He was much smaller than the other boys. He looked like he was probably two or three grades behind them, to tell you the truth. And uh, th he had a little speech impediment, and he had this infectious smile and this blonde hair, and he was one of those kinds of kids that you just want to pick up and squeeze, you know? So I was pretty excited when Cameron asked if he could have Austin over for a sleepover. And this kid arrives, and he's got this backpack that is as large as he was. And I thought, man, the fun's going to begin. See, I, I grew up basically as an only child. My brother's 10 years older than I am. My sister is 12 years older than I am. So I grew up basically as an only child. And the only people that I was ever allowed to have a sleepover were my cousins, who I got to see all the time, and that wasn't any fun. So I thought, this is going to be fun, and then I realized that uh, my idea of fun and the idea of fun for two nerdy little boys is different. There was lots of organizing of things. If you have a nerdy child, you know what I mean. They organize their toys. They organize their candy. They have it either in size or flavor or whatever. And then there was a lot of reading going on. I'm a man. Right? What do I read? Yeah. And then we did have this exciting brief trip into the world of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. But the bottom line is, I was not happy because I felt left out of this. <laughs> I felt as bad as his little brother did. So I thought, you know, I, I bet I can grab their attention with this. So I, I got the one thing I thought would be effective, and I pulled out this collection of old coins that I had accumulated over 30 years when I was growing up. We, we, my family had a grocery store, a little mom-and-pop grocery store, and uh, it was during a time when my dad would extend credit on a word to people, and they would actually come back and pay. And uh, so I was able to accumulate a lot of old coins over that time. So I had all of these things, wheat pennies, Indian head nickels. I had dimes that were nearly 100 years old, uh, silver dollars galore. And we sat down at the table, and I spread these things out, and I'm showing them to the boys, and they're getting kind of excited about it. And afterwards, I left all of that stuff on the dining room table and then put them off to bed. Uh, next morning, Vicki kind of lets me sleep in a little bit. She fixes breakfast for the boys. Then I get up, and then Austin's leaving mid-morning. And <laughs> the following day, after he left, my administrative assistant buzzes me and says that John and Austin are in the outer office and they want to see me. So she brings them on back. And I shake John's hand. And I'm looking at Austin and he's got these eyes that are like this. You know, and I thought, everything okay? And John just looked down at Austin and said, tell him. And so I looked at Austin, and he looked at me, and he started to cry, and he put out his hand. And I said, what's that? And I reached, and he dropped one of my dimes in his, into my hand. And I said, well, where'd you get this? He said, I stole it. <laughs> I said, I, I realized how curious you were. And I said, that's all right. You can have the dime. And John said, no, he can't. And I said, really, I don't mind. I've got others. He, he can have this. He said, if he had asked you for it and you had given it to him, that would be fine. But now he can't have it. Finished talking to him. And then came this apology that just broke my heart. And so I expressed my appreciation to John, and I reassured Austin of my love for him. And they left the office, and I got to thinking about that thing. And I thought, you know, my friend John here appreciated my willingness to give the dime back to Austin, but his appreciation of integrity 
and responsibility was even greater. And that day, I don't know what happened before they got there, but that day in my office, he taught that boy a lesson about our honesty and integrity and being responsible for your actions. It was a good thing. It doesn't happen too much now. You think about it, that was 20, almost 25 years ago. My wife is no longer in the school system, and one of the reasons she's no longer in the school system is because parents don't believe their kids are responsible for anything. Don't you be one of those. I have your kids in the youth group. I'll tell you what they're like, and I just happen to love them. But I've had parents come to me and say, my child doesn't lie. And I say, what universe do you live in? <laughs> Did you lie when you were a child? What makes you think your child's not going to lie to you if they think their backside's on the line? Well, that's the problem, though. That's right. Their backside's never on the line, is it? John taught him a lesson. I want you to understand, there is no doubt as to the influence, whether it's good or bad, of fathers. Now, I know some folks don't like fathers. Some women don't want their fathers in their lives or their husbands in their lives. I don't know what that's all about. I can only tell you this, and I'm going to use the words of the present. The science is in, and it's confirmed. Only unlike climate change, it's true. Uh, Whether or not you agree with it, the, the influence of fathers is indisputable. Even if they are absent, fathers still bear an amazing influence on their children. Let me give you some disturbing statistics. Now, the last census report we have was from 2010, so these are going to be dated somewhere around 2011. But some of them are from the Census Bureau, some of them are from the Department of Health and Human Services, and some of them from the Centers of Disease Control. Here you go. 63% of teen suicide completions occur in fatherless homes. That's five times the national average. 90% of runaway teens come from fatherless homes. 32 times the national average. 85% of children uh, diagnosed with serious behavioral problems come from fatherless homes, 20 times the national average. 71% of high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. That's from the Department of Education, nine times the national average. 85% of youth in de juvenile detention come from fatherless homes. Now, I don't want to get beat up about this after church either, so don't, if you're going to come to me to do that, just go ahead and just decide now you have to wait till another time because I'm not in the mood for it today. Uh, I love mothers, and I have great respect for mothers, and I have even greater respect for those mothers who by no choice of their own find themselves having to take care of children and run households without the help of a husband and a father. Some of the strongest women I've ever known in my life have been single mothers. That's indisputable, too. But I got to tell men that God designed the family to provide the gifts and the skills and the influence of both a mother and a father. And the one thing I'm grateful for at this point 2014, as I come up on my 60th birthday, can you believe that? 60th birthday, how I've seen things change, but thank God in our society today there have been grandfathers and uncles and stepfathers who have stepped up to the pl plate to provide the influence for children in need whose fathers are absent. Or perhaps whose fathers don't need to bear any influence. Toward the end of his life, King David, sick, thought that his, his, his death was imminent, and he wanted to have a conversation where he offered his son Solomon, who was his co-regent at the time, kind of a co-king. He was going to step onto the throne when David died. It was kind of like a, this is what you need to do to have the right kind of life. <coughs> He wanted to give him some words of wisdom 
that would direct his life as he matured into manhood because at the time he was probably just in his early 20s. And the Apostle Paul possibly possibly picked up on those words in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. But let me just, let me just read those to you. Second Kings, David, as the time approached for David to die, he instructed his son Solomon. This is what he said. As for me, I am going the way of all the earth. Do you hear the confidence in that statement? He doesn't fear death. And he sees it as a part of life. And he knows what lies beyond for him. So he has no fear. I am going the way of all the earth. And then he says to Solomon, be strong and be courageous like a man. And keep your obligation to the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, commands, ordinance, and decrees. This is written in the law of Moses, so that you will have success in everything you do and wherever you turn and so that the Lord will carry out his promise that he made to me. Be strong, be courageous like a man, keep your obligation to the Lord your God to walk in his ways and keep his commands. Now this is what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Paul's ending up that letter to the church at Corinth, and you understand that this was a patriarchal society, so when he's writing, he's anticipating that this is probably, for the most part, going to be a gathering of men who are going to be listening to the reading of the letter. And he says to them, beginning in verse 13, Be alert, stand firm in the faith, act like a man, and be strong. Your every action must be done with love. It must be motivated by love. Now, why did I choose these passages? Because we live in a time and we live in a place where the concept of manhood has evolved. And i got to tell you, much of that evolution has come as a, as a result of the radical feminist movement. But the church has also contributed to that evolution. I've watched it. From the time I was a little boy, my, you know, my mother, when she was pregnant, she probably went to church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night. And I know that I was in the cradle roll about two weeks after I was born. And then I know from my earliest childhood memories, because my dad didn't go to church, somehow he thought a six-year-old would be protection for my mother, so I never had a choice. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, cottage prayer meetings, revival meetings, business meetings, girls' auxiliary meetings, WMU meetings. I had to go. I was the highest-ranking girls in action. I, I was a queen with a scepter. Don't say anything about me. It was one of those times when you said, you know, I may as well just participate. i got to be here anyway. All right? But one thing I remember is that some of the men that worked with us as children, and by the way, you really don't see that in churches now, do you? It's hard to get a man to work with children. It's hard to get a man to work with youth. It's hard to get a man to work with Awana or R-rated or anything like that. I don't know. Maybe it's just not manly enough. Anyway, the men that worked with me for so many years, I looked upon with great respect. They were soldiers. They were firefighters. They were EMTs. What they call them at that time, rescue squad? No, maybe it was just an ambulance. I don't know. Uh, and you know, 
it was not all in a classroom memorizing scriptures. They took us to camp. They played ball with us. They had us involved in, I mean, even though my father had been largely emotionally absent from me, though he lived in the home, I had all of these other men investing their lives into me that helped to shape me into the man that I would become. Unfortunately, since then, somehow, some way, the church has contributed to the feminization of manhood in this country. I think we have pretty much emasculated our men because we stress so much the meekness of being a follower of Christ that we've now turned it into weakness and we don't stand for much at all. We have no fight. John Eldridge wrote a book a few years back called Wild at Heart, and in that book he attempts to help us recover the concept of biblical manhood, and it bears reading if you're interested. I mean, that it, it's, it's an excellent book, but I just want to give you a few quotes from it, okay? Masculinity is an essence that is hard to articulate, but a boy naturally craves it as he craves food and water. Do you know what we do when that craving starts to come out? Stop that. Be careful. You'll get hurt. Please don't take that Pop-Tart to school and bite it till it's in the shape of a gun. These are the kinds of things that boys naturally do because God has ingrained in them this desire for adventure because they are male. Here's another quote. Yes, a man is a dangerous thing. So is a scalpel. <laughs> so what's the point there? Depends on how it's used, right? If you've got a ruptured appendix, you want a man who knows how to use a scalpel real well. <laughs> it depends on in whose hands the man is, whether he's dangerous or not. How about this? A man needs a battle to fight. He needs a place for the warrior in him to come alive and be honored and trained and seasoned. If we can awaken that fierce quality in a man and hook it up to a higher purpose and release the warrior then the boy can grow up and become a true man of God. I agree. Thank you, Christina. She got it. How about this quote? Yes, true strength does not come out of bravado. Until we are broken, our life will be self-centered, self-reliant, and all of our strength will be only our own. And this, this one statement is really the key concept for the entire book. Deep in his heart, every man longs for a battle to fight, an adventure to live, and a beauty to rescue. Do you really have to ask why we don't like chick flicks? Why are we drawn to superhero movies? Why are we drawn to action movies? Why are we drawn to war movies? Because what he's saying is true. Every man in his heart longs to be Spider-Man, not to have the supernatural powers, but to be able to fight the battle, to be able to win the battle, to be able to rescue the damsel. And, you know, unfortunately, we seem to have missed the point that a lot of women like that. One last quote. Our whole journey into authentic masculinity centers around those cool-of-the-day talks with God. Simple questions change hassles into adventures. 
and the events of our lives become opportunities for initiation. So, what I'm telling you is that on this Father's Day, June 15th, 2014, it's time for the men of God to step up and to become the men God created them to be. It's time for us to step up and to become the spiritual leaders in our homes and in our churches and in our communities. It is time for men to begin to live out the adventure that comes when we walk with God, to join in the battle for the hearts and souls of our families and our communities and our nation, and to protect our mothers and our wives and our daughters from the dangers of a broken world. That's what it means to be a man of God. It's time for men to take back their manhood from a bunch of cultural mores that have diluted the values that we used to hold dear, like honesty and integrity and responsibility. It's time for men to raise the bar of expectation for ourselves and for our children. My dad, with all of his flaws, always said things to me like, I want you to be better than I am. I want you to have it better than I have, so I have high expectations for you. It's time for us to set the example for our families and other, others around us, for our children to be able to look at us like we're God. Let us be the ones to break the news to them that we are Caesar. Don't let them see it. Don't let them see it because we fall into that trap. It's time for us to get involved in accountability relationships with other men. You know what? Men really hate that because they don't want to sit down and open up with anybody about the brokenness that's going on in their lives. But men, we to we're told in the Scripture that iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another man. And we need to develop those kinds of relationships where we can be brutally honest with one another and know that it's held in confidence and that we're going to be prayed for and that we're going to be held accountable and that there aren't going to be tongues wagging out there about what we reveal. Here's the picture. We are men. We are created in the image of God. He created us for the purpose of living in a way that brings glory to God. And it was he who chose to create us as warriors. And we are warriors, whether we are on the battle, battle front lines uh, of the war on terror or whether we are in the trenches of missionary work uh, to those who desperately need to know about Jesus or whether we're just sitting in a one-on-one -on -one dialogue with a child who's struggling to discover his or her identity. We are warriors. Unfortunately, we are men who far too often get bogged down in the mundane schedule of life because we prefer the familiar and the comfortable to the real danger that comes when we follow God with our whole heart. It's true, you know. I try not to talk a whole lot about the history of Nova Church, but I've got to tell you, one of the most frightening times in my life was two and a half years ago. I sat in my office because I was going to have my quarterly business meeting that night with representatives from our churches. And I was going to tell them that God had called me to do this, knowing full well that they had every right to say, you can go ahead and do this, you just can't keep your job. I prayed, I puked, I worried, I wondered, I tried to renege on God, and he wouldn't let me out of, the, out of the deal. It was absolutely terrifying. And here we are. You know how many times I've wanted to quit since then? 
100, 150. Hold on, motorboat. There have been many times I've wanted to pack it in and say, this is too hard. <laughs> but the thing is, if I'd have done that at any point, there have been some of you wonderful folks that I would have never gotten to know as well as I have. It's been an adventure. It's been uncomfortable, and it hasn't been very familiar, and I wouldn't trade this adventure for the world. I wish I'd have done it 30 years ago. What are you missing? Because you're not willing to be a little wild at heart, men. We are men. And it's time for us to step up. David's words to, to Solomon are God's words to us. Paul's encouragement to the Corinthians, God's encouragement to us. Be strong, be courageous. Keep your obligations to the Lord your God to walk in his ways. Keep his statutes, keep his commands, keep his ordinance, keep his decrees. You'll find them in the scriptures. Be alert, stand firm in your faith, act like a man and be strong. But remember, your every action must be done with and motivated by love. So you see, we don't need to go to men's help. We don't need to go to Cosmo. We don't need to go to the Huffington Post. We don't need to go to a Hollywood movie to find out what a man is really supposed to be. That's in the scriptures. What defines a man biblically? This is a short list that I've got you here today. You need to understand that it's not a, an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination. Study the scriptures. Study the Bible. Just, just read it. Ask God to reveal to you any time you read over a passage and just tell him you want him to red flag you and say, this is a passage about what it means to be a godly man. But for now, these four will form a pretty good foundation. Here they are. Number one, courage. He talks about that. He talks about that. Be alert. Stand firm in your, in your faith. Uh, act like a man. Be strong. Be courageous. You know, one of the problems in our society today is if a man stands on the principles of God's word, he knows he's going to be labeled intolerant or a hater or a bigot or something like that. And so what do we do because we fear being labeled? We don't take a stand. We don't take a stand. You know, when you are courageous and bold as a follower of Jesus, it does not mean that you have to be angry at anyone. It does not mean that you have to fight anyone. What it does mean, it mean is that you're willing to take a stand even if you stand alone. There are not, many that, not, not that many courageous people out there. There really aren't. We like to think we are, but not really. We'll compromise in a minute if we think it'll keep us out of conflict. But when you compromise the principles of the Scripture, you've failed. See? Have the courage to stand. And then he says... What I call conviction. You know, stand firm in your faith. Stand firm on what you've been taught. Both David and P, uh, Paul talk about that. And all I'm suggesting here is that this means have a high biblical standard. You don't need to have a worldview that is carnal. You don't need to have a worldview that is natural. You're going to follow Jesus. You have to have a worldview that is biblically based. It's not a Baptist worldview. It's not even a Christian worldview. It is a biblical worldview. And you simply live by this as the guideline. If it says it, then that's what I believe. Again, doesn't mean that you have to be caustic or abrasive with anyone. You just choose to let this be the guideline for your value system. Conviction. We need men especially to be people of conviction today. 
How about this? Consistency. Anybody ever heard the words, do as I say and not as I do? Anybody ever said it? Well, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 is one of my favorite verses because in that passage, Paul says to the Corinthian church, you imitate me as I imitate Christ. And that's something that every father should tell their children. And we should be so confident in the way we walk with God that we can say to our children, you follow my example, you look to me for the lead because I'm going to be following Jesus. You follow me. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Remember that verse says something about a, what is it, a ravenous and roaring lion? Be serious. Be alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. You resist him. You stand firm in your faith, knowing that the same sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. Be consistent. And the last one is consumed. Be consumed by an unquenchable love for and hunger for God. You just want to know him better. You want to serve him more. And the only way that you can do that is to spend time with him in his word, to spend time in prayer, and to spend time listening to what he's trying to tell you. Be consumed not only with a passion for God, but with an unwavering commitment to your wife and your children. We have too many men out there who claim to be followers of Christ who are dilly-dallying on the side, and that just doesn't speak well of our faith, doesn't speak well of our Savior. That woman that God has given you, what does the Scripture say? He he who finds a wife finds a good thing. Treat her as a gift from God. Treat your children as a gift from God. Be the man for them. You not only have a passion for God and an unwavering commitment to your wife and children, you have compassion for others. We have an example to raise our children and to lead our families in such a way that they know that we are servants by nature when we become followers of Jesus. And that we reach out to others with compassion and love. Be the man that does that. Okay? It's that simple. It's that simple. It's time for us to step up. Here's what you do. Here's what I want you to do. First, I want you to trust and obey and follow your Heavenly Father. This is Father's Day. For some of you, it's time for you to step forward and say, all right, I'm going to do that. I look out here and see most of you, and I look at these men and think you, most of you have already said, I'm going to follow Jesus, but there are a couple of you that maybe haven't. This is your day. This is your time. When you hear that voice of God speaking to you, just a little nudge in your heart and your mind, that's him saying, you got to make this your day. And then when you make that commitment to follow Jesus, follow through with it. Be, get into the process of becoming the man that God wants you to be. Follow Jesus. The second thing I want you to do is hold to the principles in, of, of Scripture with courage. You know, there are going to be a lot of people out there when you start saying, I'm going to live according to the principles of Scripture. This is going to be the basis of my faith, and they're going to make fun of you, and they're going to try to argue with you and debate you, and you just have to be a person that says with great conviction, this is what I believe, and this is why I believe it, and nothing that you're going to say is going to change my mind. And number three, become the man God created you to be. Be the warrior. Be the adventurer. Be the rescuer. 
in Ezekiel chapter 22. It's a kind of a sad verse. God is talking to Ezekiel about what's going on in the land where they live, and it's really deteriorated badly. God says the people of the land have practiced extortion. They've committed robbery. They have oppressed the poor and the needy. They've unlawfully exploited the foreign residents. And then he says this. I searched for a man among them who would repair the wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land so that I might not destroy it, but I found no one. Very well may be that the reason that our nation is taking the course that it's taking and the reason that our churches are as weak as they are is because the men who say they're men of God have failed to stand up and be the man. It's time for us to do it. Okay, let's pray together. Please tell me uh, if today God has spoken to you and called you out and you have said, yes, I will become a follower of Jesus today. Just slip your hand up right back there. I just want to see it so that I can pray for you. I'm not going to call you by name right now. All right. Men, it's time to step up. It is time to quit playing footsies with God and go wholehearted in our relationship with Him. And I hope that's something that is a gift that you will give your family today. Lord God, thank you so much for the gift of fathers. We are grateful that in your great love for us, your preferred title is to be our father. God, as we look at this day as an opportunity to remember and to honor our earthly fathers, God, help us to remember and honor you as well as our heavenly father. And perhaps that begins with a yielding of our lives and our spirits, with a yielding of our possessions and our families so that we follow you with the whole heart, not holding anything back. Help us as men to step up and to stand out as men of God, to be the husbands and the fathers that you've called us to be. God, I pray for those mothers, especially today, who find themselves single parenting, and I pray, God, that you would just give them the strength and wisdom they need, especially as they're dealing with boys they might instill into those young men the principles of biblical manhood. Lord, we love you and we thank you for allowing us to be a part of your mission, your kingdom work. Help us not ever to become a church that is so focused on the inward of our own little church family that we fail to see all of those folks outside of our church walls who need your grace, who need your healing who need that special touch, and help us to be instruments to provide those things. Go with these folks today, God, as we leave this place. May we be encouraged by your word and by this time of worship, and may we be a blessing to others this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Happy Father's Day. Thank you so much. Don't forget, bring me some spaghetti this week. Uncooked.